Today we're going to cover a very popular topic at the moment, which is longevity. So uh, maybe it would be interesting to unwrap what you think longevity actually is. Is it possible? Uh, and uh, what can we do about it? Because my perception is that as attractive as it sounds, maybe it's all about getting the higher quality of life than focusing on prolonging life because we can prolong life by doing all kind of weird stuff doesn't mean that we actually live so what's your take on is longevity possible and what it actually would require for us to do to make sure that our body does not just live long but live high quality uh, of life for a little bit longer yeah yeah so so the main thing that I have a problem with, especially with everybody talking about longevity, right? Like, oh, this peptide will increase longevity or this this particular protocol will increase longevity is they don't actually know that, right? They don't, they cannot tell you that you are gonna live an extra 15 years or 20 years or whatever arbitrary attachment people have to it. And m most often it's not even a number. It's just, oh, I'm increasing my longevity. <laughs> well. Longevity is a, a like a, uh, how, how would I say? It can shrink and grow depending on the actions from this time forward. In other words, if I change a lot of the things in my lifestyle, the way I eat, the way where I live, all of those things, I can immediately impact my longevity from this point forward in a positive or negative way, right? That doesn't mean that I will actually fulfill the scenario, the probability just increases one way or another. So number one, people need to stop thinking about this in absolute terms. It's just probabilities, right? Nothing says it will happen. I mean, you could literally, right? You could literally be doing everything correct and you could get in a car accident, right? Or yeah. again, that's very, how would I say, uh, you know, to the point of like, well, yeah, there's no guarantees, right? But it goes even further than that, right? Like you could break a leg, and next thing you know, that changes your lifestyle, right? Or break a hip uh, or get in, a, in an accident where you don't die, but it changes your lifestyle. So from that point forward, now longevity has been impacted, even though before then you were doing all kinds of positive things, right? So that's what I want to establish right off the bat when people talk about a longevity. It's all probabilities and nothing is solid, okay? Nothing is solid, right? Now, Let's is talk there about anything what? before you move forward is there anything yeah. that can be shown from any particular test how long your body might be able to live you know uh, what i mean by that it comes to my mind is like telomere lengths and all these kind of things yeah yeah so i mean those are all proxies right so then that and that's why i say what i said just before right all of this is a guess all of it is a probabilities game because none of it actually measures actual longitudinal age uh, telomeres is a perfect example. We know that as you age, telomeres get shorter. So anything that increases your telomeres should result in a long life. Or in other words, you have, think of it like a tire, right? The tire's thread got longer. So now you can run that tire for longer. But what happens if all of a sudden you're, 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 you're normally drive at 40 miles an hour, but now you're driving at 80 miles an hour, even though you got better, t uh, more longer uh, tire tread, you increase the amount of wear on the tire. So the net result is about the same. See, and that's what I'm getting at where you can be doing things that augment certain out so certain measurements like telomere length, but you could be doing other things that run the cycle faster, right? So it's one of those things where you almost have to encompass everything you're doing, right? Now, one of those key metrics that could run the cycle faster that also is tied to longevity is sleep, right? So we know that as you age, your sleep declines. You sleep less and less and less, right? Now we actually know, this has actually been shown in, I think it was like 2020 or 2019, where we actually know the actual mechanism that governs sleep now. We, it, it, it comes down to Shaker and Sandman, and these are genes, right? These are genes that turn on when NADPH is oxidized. So in other words, if you are not oxidizing any NADPH, Shaker and Sandman aren't coordinating to make you sleep. When you oxidize NADPH correctly, 
and then you reduce it correctly at night, now Shaker and Sandman are coordinated correctly and you sleep really well, right? So one of the key metrics is how has your sleep been declining? That doesn't mean that if you get four hours of sleep that you're gonna have a short life or five hours of sleep. It means that if you normally used to sleep eight hours and over the course of decades, now you're sleeping four hours, your longevity is de declining. But if you normally, you know, for you know, decade or more, you've been sleeping six hours or five hours and it's been consistent and it doesn't really ever decline, you're probably not declining your age. So it's more of what is the pattern? What is the, the actual um, trend of your sleep? Is it getting shorter? Is it staying the same? Or is it getting longer? That is actually a bigger component because as we sit here in life, right? Life is governed by two stages, being awake and being asleep. No others in between unless you synthetically put somebody on a ventilator or something like that, then they're in neither one, right? They're, they're in this uh, point. But any blind and is not on a ventilator or not brain dead, um, <clears throat> they're either awake or they're asleep. There isn't much in between, right? The, there, there is different modalities of sleep, you know, deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep, and then you're either awake, right? Now, when you're awake, you're supposed to be oxidizing an ADPH at the mitochondrial level. Now, oxidizing it involves interacting with the environment because oxidizing it correctly is what signals these genes, Shaker and Sandman, to put you to sleep at night to reduce that oxidized NADPH back to reduced NADPH. So it goes NADPH plus or NADP plus, that's the oxidized version. And then when you sleep, you restore that to NADPH. So the, the, the oxidized and reduced, that's just a chemical terminology for we've taken a hydrogen away and then we've added a hydrogen back, right? That's all that that means. And that's all your body is doing in this cyclical manner of awake and asleep. The more efficient you are at doing that, the longer your life will be. It's really that simple. So life is a dual form substance and a lot of people just don't pay attention that it does two things always it's always doing two things when you're awake you're supposed to be oxidizing this nadph into nadp plus if you don't do that effectively then you don't signal to per turn it back the other way when you sleep everything that we've talked about this that we've talked about in the superhuman series are active ways that you can change your lifestyle and some of them are nutritional habits uh, so that your mitochondria actively do that correctly, right? There's supposed to be a lot of oxidative stress during the day. That's what signals the body to recover correctly. And then the absence of light is what tells the body to reduce it back. So adding things right now, right off the bat, people with any kind of chemistry know-how and stuff are like, oh, well, we, maybe we can take, you know, NA, NADB plus or NAD or all these other potential things that influence that cycle. And the answer is for a short period of time, that might work. But that NADPH and NAD plus is supposed to be chronically tied to the environmental seasonal changes that happen in your environment. When you start to mess with them, you can permanently dysregulate those, right? I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, old school, like cars and stuff like that, where there's a timing mechanism that you could adjust and forward back for like, uh, you know, carburetors and stuff like that. The point being is you can manually mess with this if you go up an elevation and, and make the engine run better. Or when the car, you know, when you would take the tractor or the car down to a lower elevation, you had to manually mess with this it would run correctly. But the problem is you can always mess with them so much that you ruin the engine, mm. right? So I have a question regards on how to acknowledge that, but, but uh, going back to what you were talking about sleep. So if your sleep quality declines, your longevity sort of declines as well. What I want to highlight is that that means in that time only, that doesn't need forever. You can kind of fix that, which brings me to a question. How applicable are these things that we see, which is DNA testing? You know, because they're going to show you, hey, you got this, you got that, you got that. And 
we both kind of understand that evolution does not work that way. DNA can be changed through the time. So how useful it is to run DNA tests and then based on that test, take uh, whatever doctors usually prescribe to increase quality of your life and increase your longevity and things like that. What, uh, is there a, anything that kind of can backfire? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Definitely can backfire. So let me just give you a quick rundown of DNA testing is in the nucleus, right? So that's the genes in the nucleus of the cell, okay? Those are supposed to be dormant, right? Now, just to, just to kind of like highlight this, you and I share 99.6% of our DNA between me and you and with chimpanzees, okay? So our nuclear DNA that me and you possess are basically identical and you take our DNA and you compare it to a chimpanzee or a gorilla, and it's very, very close. It's only a half a percent different. So the nuclear DNA essentially has all of the possible building blocks to build a human or a chimp or a gorilla, right? Which are vastly different. We all understand that part. So nuclear DNA, think of it like a filing cabinet that has all of the different protocols and all of the different blueprints to make just about anything. A lot of them are not even on. They're not even on, right? Because obviously me and you are not gorillas or chimps. So the genes that are turned on on them are not turned on on us, but we have them, okay? So what tells the filing cabinet which blueprints to run? That's a different genetic. That's your mitochondrial genetics. So in a cell, right, if we have them uh, nucleus and, um, and all the mitochondria in a cell, the mitochondria possess the ability to turn on and off genes at the nucleus, okay? And what governs the mitochondria that turn them on and off is your environment and the haplotype of the mitochondria. So if there was any kind of genetic testing that I would do, I would go out of my way to get, it is mitochondrial haplotype testing because that tells you your, and, the, and by the way, this mitochondrial genetic test only comes from your mother. Your mitochondria only come from your mother. So knowing your mother's mitochondrial test or your grandmother's mitochondrial test tells you by default yours, right? So that's a little hack in case somebody, you know, maybe their mom knows what it is and, and uh, they would uh, by default already know what, what theirs are, okay? But that tells you a couple things, right? Because the mitochondrial haplotype basically looks like this. L haplotypes are equatorial haplotypes. N, N, A, and M haplotypes go, uh, uh, exist at the 20 degree latitude or a little bit higher, 20 to 30 degree latitude. Then we have H's and Z's, W's and, and K's. Those are all up at the high latitudes, right? So why do I say it like that? And that's because as you go away from the equator, those haplotypes become more uncoupled. What does that mean? That means that they waste energy and don't need as much sunlight to run effectively. What they need is a little bit more cold to run effectively, to turn on the right machinery genetically internally, right? Now, if you're an L haplotype, that's at the equator. That means that if you are an L haplotype and you live in New York, for example, you are going to struggle with health because your mitochondria will never be able to run effectively because they're tightly coupled. That means it needs a lot of electrons either coming from carbohydrate sources and sunlight at the same time because cytochrome one governs how you use carbohydrates and cytochrome one is, uh, how would I say, uh, programmed by sunlight. So if you don't have sunlight, you can't eat carbs. But if you do have sunlight, you can eat more carbs. And if you're an L haplotype, that's the that's the recipe. Your mitochondria has been effectively become so coupled that it needs sunlight and carbs. And if you just continue to provide that, your mitochondria run in extremely efficiently, very efficiently, to the point where some of the longest lived people are L haplotypes, right? They they just but they're but they are chronically in that environment. Mm. High sunlight environment, high sunlight environment means that carbohydrates are readily available year round all the time. They eat a lot of carbs, they get 
a lot of sunlight and that couples with their haplotype very well. Now on the flip side, right? There are haplotypes, Japan for some reason, or not for some reason, but for, for as, a, as an example, that's a higher latitude country. That's a latitude like 40, um, 45 actually, I think, 40 to 45. But they have a different haplotype, right? They have a haplotype that is more Northern. So they're slightly uncoupled. Um, so they end up meeting a lot more pork and fish and, and meat sources that couple nicely with cytochrome number two, not cytochrome number one. And because Japan has a lot of uh, magnetism, right? they have a lot of earthquakes, they have a lot of fault lines, they have a lot of volcanic, volcanic activity, they have hot springs, all of that stuff. The area that they live in provides electrons, not from sunlight, but from their local environment with high magnetism. So high magnetism, less sunlight, cytochrome 2 is now exponentially uh, genetically exploited, and they happen to eat in that manner. So what you can learn from places like blue zones is not what are they eating, at least not by itself. It is what are they eating? What is the type of food that they eat predominantly, the types of food? And what is that in relationship to the latitude? And you'll find that almost always in any blue zone, they eat to the latitude. They eat seasonally to that latitude. So now the, their food and their environment are coupled. And then the next thing that you'll notice is they tend to spend a lot of time outside. So that means that now their mitochondria is coupled to the environment and their food is coupled to the environment. The winning equation for longevity or making sure that your mitochondria clean up things appropriately every single evening and every and do things appropriately every single morning and throughout the day is to couple your biology your body with the environment and to couple the food that you put into your environment or which is your internal environment that to to the environment in other words you don't eat fake processed foods and you don't eat out of season because you just eat locally in that local environment and you are chronically exposed biologically to that local environment. That actively makes sure that the information going to the mitochondria from food and from sunlight, cold, et cetera, any environmental process that interacts with you is also giving information to that mitochondria. Then the mitochondria goes, oh, this all matches up that we should turn on these nuclear genes. Right. So now it's the sending information to the nucleus that, oh, we should turn on this particular gene for being able to create heat and be able to dissipate uh, other molecular processes like sex hormones and things of that nature, uh, because this environment tells us that we need to do it in this manner. So it tells the nucleus how to do it. Whereas if, uh, you know, you lived somewhere at a lower latitude and ate different foods, it would tell the genes to turn on different things, right? Um, for example, if you live at a higher latitude and you're living a good circadian entrained lifestyle, you're probably going to disproportionately carry a little bit more subcutaneous fat on your body for longevity purposes, because what it's doing is it's protecting you against the environment. And a lot of people don't know this. Your fat is where you make your stem cells, right? You have stem cells. They are made in your fat. If you go to collect, uh, like if you go to a stem cell clinic that collects stem cells, they're going to collect it from body fat, right? So people don't know that. So, so in higher latitude environments, you're, you end up disproportionately growing a little bit of your own stem cells every single winter so that when springtime comes around, you can actually undo the body fat stuff, like lose body fat. And when in the process of doing that, you're activating stem cells to repair you from a lack of sunlight, right? Those are genes that are being turned on and off at the nucleus, and they're being turned on and off by the, by the mitochondria because the mitochondria is the one that's sensing high sunlight or low sunlight. And it's also sen sensing high electron foods versus low electron foods because of the season change, right? So when the mitochondria senses that, it changes the nuclear genes to set you up for longevity. The more that process gets disconnected, the more you can end up with cancers, the more you can end up with disproportionate visceral fat gain, because visceral fat by any means is always a bad thing, but subcutaneous fat, not so much, if you're entrained in the right environment, right? At a low environment, you're just not going to carry very much subcutaneous body fat because your mitochondria has interpreted that, hey, this person doesn't actually ever miss any sunlight. And this person actually doesn't even miss electrons from food because all the food here is high electron food. 
So it doesn't, it doesn't start telling the nuclear genes to store body fat in any kind of way. You actually don't store that much unless you start messing with it, like staying up at night all the time, uh, using a lot of artificial light. You start messing with that circadian switch that the mitochondria is, is playing with or, or sensing. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, looking at that, we can do a DNA testing and whatnot, and then we go look at DNA testing for people who are living in a blue zone, so to speak. And now we start prescribing vitamins, nutrients, all kind of medication for people who don't live in that zone. That actually can dampen their ability to live as long as they could if they don't change the environment. Is that what I'm getting correctly? Yeah, that, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. If you're trying to change the nuclear genetics by supplementing something, but you don't actually live where they got the results from, you could be making it worse. Because see, your mitochondria is always trying to make you live longer. Like, don't don't get me wrong. This whole process of of people getting fat out of no reason when they live in a high technology city or something like that, that actually could be protective. We don't know that yet. Right. Because of what I said earlier, subcutaneous body fat is where your stem cells are, right? So if your body is sensing lots of cellular damage, it's probably going to put on more body fat than you would think because mm -hmm. it's trying to prepare you for when you get out of that environment that you can now metabolize that fat, which will also have your stem cells to repair all of your cellular damage. Again, we don't actually know that with 100% certainty. But just from knowing this and putting the puzzle pieces together, you can start to understand that, hey, in certain circumstances, body fat accrual could be protective for that person if they're in a really bad environment. Right. And we, we already know that anecdotally from holistic um, medicine doctors and stuff like that, where they talk about, hey, uh, you know, they talk about it in the, in, the, in the form of toxins and heavy metals. Hey, your body fat is where your body puts toxins and heavy metals to protect you they're not technically wrong but it goes way further than that it protects you from a lot of other things like electromagnetic field cellular damage and things of that nature and the fat itself contains your stem cells the point being when you see disproportionate fat gain uh disproportionate energy loss to the environment the body is setting you up for eventually going to an environment that is helpful you just have to follow through with that, which is something rarely that modern humans do. See, through evolutionary means, we as humans never stayed in the same place for more than a few months. Hmm. You, you see what I'm saying? At yeah. some point, the mitochondria is anticipating a change in the environment, whether that's seasonal change or you're relocating. But when yeah. you don't, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. These points are interesting because that kind of uh, might explain that uh, oftentimes you might perceive that increase in body fat shortens your lifespan, but what you're, if I'm getting it correct, you kind of explain that it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to live shorter lifetime. It might, might actually help you live longer. You just don't have the, um, the quality of life you would expect from uh, living the way you live, you know, because we all have unlimited amount of uh, food available and all those kind of things. We expect to be high energy, always driven, all these kind of things. But in reality, we might not have any of that, but we still live longer because right. our body tries to protect us from the, all the things that we do incorrectly. Yeah, 100%. You said it, you said it just right. So, um, you know, highlighting the, what I said at the very, very beginning, the whole longevity thing, that's a moving target and it's only probabilities. And acutely, right at the very moment, you may be lowering anecdotally your longevity but in the terms of, hey, if you accrue body fat, most people associate that with mortality. But that could be setting you up for longer longevity if you understand how to read the tea leaves, right? How to read the signs of, oh, this is an environment problem. I should check my environment or change it. And then all of a sudden you change it into a positive environment, but you've had uh, higher amounts of body fat. And then guess what happens? Your body changes, your body composition changes, and you it burns up some body fat, S stem cells now get uh, proliferated. And now you repaired your body from a bad environment because you moved to a good environment. And then from that point, the probability of a longer lifespan has increased, not decreased. You see what I'm saying? Because it's all about probabilities. That's why I opened with what I said at the beginning. 
at the moment, you may be getting readings that show longer lifespan, but you're actually doing things that will eventually give you lower lifespan. And the opposite is also true. At the moment, you may be experiencing or doing things that are disproportionately seeming like it's cutting down your lifespan. But if you change it, the environment, lifestyle, et cetera, then you disproportionately could be setting yourself up for a longer lifespan. And that can all be changed by your very acutely, very fast, right? Mm -hmm. Within a year, if you know what you're doing, and you are willing to do the things that uh, that for for that to happen, yeah, you could be increasing your lifespan all of a sudden instead of shortening it. Even though, from an outside perspective, people would would associate all of that as negative. So, where does strength training come in play? Because we see more often than not that every doctor who is uh, well, not every doctor, but majority of doctors now swing in the side like, hey, the stronger, the fitter you are, the longer you're gonna live. And now they're starting to push towards the like, okay, you need to figure out your gut health and so on. So we, we have a full video just on gut health. So yeah, what yeah, the strength yeah, training yeah, in place. Yeah. Yeah. So so the 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 strength training does, I would say the act of strength training is dependent on your environment. There are times where I have actively not strength trained because my environment is bad, okay? So the act of strength training can be damaging, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, being strong, once you've accumulated strength and accumulated muscle tissue, your body doesn't get rid of that all of a sudden, right? Like it's not something that goes away very, very easily. If you've dedicated, you know, three or five years to this you're not going to lose that in one year of not training so the accumulation of it and the maintenance of it is way more important than the actual repetitive act of going to the gym right um so i would say yes when you have a good amount of muscle mass and you have a good amount of strength it will help you in the longevity gain because it makes you not frail in other words as you age Bones will be thicker to begin with because you strength trained um, and, and so forth. And so you'll, you're less likely to break a bone, less likely to break a hip. You're, you're going to have more muscle mass, so you'll be more mobile, right? And if you're more mobile, you're more likely to go for a walk in the mornings and you're more likely to be outside. You, you see what I'm saying? Like the actual act of getting strong and having muscle mass will always have a net benefit. The environment that you do it in sometimes can have a negative uh outcome for health and here's an example right i know this because i've been kind of looking into this for quite a bit because i've had some really strange finding where you know for the most part we, we i just mentioned like hey if you have good amount of of uh strength you should have a good amount of bone mineral density that's not always the case because if you live in a high electromagnetic field place like uh, let's just hypothetically say uh new york city or london right a really densely packed city with high amounts of electromagnetic fields. You could disproportionately have more muscle mass than normal or, or look fit and, and get a DEXA scan and still come back with, hey, you're, you have bone mineral loss. You actually don't have very thick bones. And why is that? Because electromagnetic fields induce a calcium channel response at the cellular level. What does that mean? It means that the cells are stressed and using calcium to protect themselves. Where is the calcium coming from? It's coming from your bones. So the environment, if you strength train in a certain environment, can actually be detrimental if the environment is not conducive for health. And that is actually one of the reasons why I stopped strength training for a year. I've, I've moved out of my environment. Now I can strength train just fine. But in that environment, there were things that were tipping me off to, hey, something is wrong externally. And when I actually found out what it was, I stopped strength training. That was step one, because I knew that the strength training now possesses a higher risk factor to hurt me than act positively, right? These are all, strength levels oh, as well. It's like the highest level of strength level you can achieve, you know? Then uh, I would love to do my own test because on Dexas kind of before I started to live uh, in really packed areas and travel a lot, my bone density was 3.7 times above normal. Mm -hmm. And I would like to check it now, uh, probably find it. Uh, well, I can go back to UK and, and just do it in the lab uh, just to see where my bone density is now, because I I strongly believe all this traveling has not done me, my body any good. 
No, no, it, it doesn't because because of this electromagnetic field effect at the at the cellular level. And it's just a it's just a calcium response, right? We know this. We know this from science that when cells are stressed, they need calcium to continue to function correctly, right? And if you continually do strength training, right? What are you already predisposing? You're putting load on the bones intentionally, right? So the bones are now responding by actually becoming uh, uh, electrified because bones are actually a diode. So they become electrified and, and they become a donator of electrons or a, a, a gatherer of electrons depending on the environment, right? So strength training in a bad environment actually predisposes your bones to donate more calcium disproportionately to your cells. Um, Whereas strength training in a positive environment, it goes the other way. You deposit more calcium into the bones because the cells aren't stressed, so they don't need extra calcium. So just, and, and again, there's a lot of other things having to do with this, but this is just one way where that happens. Um, and then if you're taking, for example, vitamin D, right? Exogenous, exogenous vitamin D, right? Because you live indoors all the time in a high electromagnetic field environment, a city and stuff like that, and you're trying to train a lot and you take a lot of vitamin D. Now, not only are you probably going to get bones that are not mineral mineralizing as well, you're also going to disproportionately store calcium in arteries and joints much more readily because they're not going to bones and your arteries are actually getting more oxidized in that environment because of cellular stress. Right. So you can disproportionately go from, hey, I have great cardiovascular scores, uh, like if you got a, a calcium score test or something like that, to now five years later, holy shit, this is not so good anymore. And if you didn't know what you were doing and the environment that you were doing it, that could have been a consequence of you've now lowered your lifespan by doing things that you thought were healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's like the right tool for the right job. You know, if you are trying to hit a nail with a bloody loaf of bread, that's going to happen. No, no. And especially if you don't understand the other environmental things. That's why, that's why we have focused so much on the, on the becoming superhuman uh, episodes. Because without a lot of science, right, like a lot of people may not have been able to follow what I stated about Shaker and Sandman and NADPH or this calcium flux or any of that. It doesn't really matter. None of that actually matters because the, the biology is very simple, right? Um, the, uh, hippos and lions don't know a damn thing about any of this stuff, but they will live to their full potential because they live out in the environment and eat appropriately to that environment, right? If, if you stop talking about humans, almost all animals live longer in the wild than they do in captivity. We know that, especially now, right? Like in the last 10, 10 years, 10 or 15 years, we've actually started to find out that the animals in zoos are starting to get the same diseases that humans get. Diabetes, uh, cardiovascular diseases, especially the primates. Why? Because we're literally feeding them just like we feed them ourselves, and we have them in cages with fake lighting all the time that turns on and off at a specific sequence that we dictate and not that the environment dictates. They're getting the same diseases. Why? Because their mitochondria is no longer appropriately able to adapt to the consequences of that environment because it's never been tuned that way before. Yeah, and you when say disease, it's it's adaptation, you know, you need to become more insulin resistant. And like you said, it actually might help them live a little bit longer, even though they they end up living less than they live in the wild. But we wouldn't know if that adaptation would not happen, that they wouldn't live even shorter lifespan. That's correct. That's 100% correct. And that is how evolution works. That is how the mitochondria is always trying to protect you and always trying to ensure proper energy to the things that matter, right? Your brain and your heart and your lungs. It, it doesn't actually care about the energy for running around and stuff like that. That's secondary, right? If there's plenty of energy for the brain, plenty of energy for your heart and your organs to all work and coordinate correctly, then and only then do you disproportionately have more electrical energy, more electrons for superfluous activity, right? And that is why I've always focused on the environment is number one. The food tied to the environment is number two. And if you get those two things, you've gotten a lot of the equation correct. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is the lack of light at night because we're diurnal creatures. We're not nocturnal creatures. Let me see if I can summarize all of it because there is a lot to unpack. So 
uh, when people talk about longevity, sometimes it can be tied to quality of life, whereas longevity means just living longer and quality of life is completely separate thing. And if somebody tries to tell you, hey, this is exactly what you need to do to live longer, that might not necessarily be true for you if they have not sat down and talked about where the hell do you actually live? Because you might be doing things that are completely wrong for you. I can only tie it down to the way I work with people. If anyone would do what I do, they would just get morbidly obese. There's, there's no question about it. Like the amount of food I eat and how I train and what I do is not something with very high body fat can, can do to begin with. They would just get injured and harm themselves and probably put themselves in a grave, so to speak. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so uh, first things first, what you need to acknowledge is, okay, you can do DNA testing, but if you're not willing to do what that DNA testing shows you to do in, and it's changing environment and try to medicate yourself out of that, it might actually backfire on you. And the best we can do for longevity is switch that mindset towards quality of life rather than longer life. So we can actually enjoy the life at a higher level rather than just drag ourselves through more years through the life. So, and the best way we can do that is eat well, stop feeding yourself like a spoiled child, work out, and, and just be present at, at where you are, you know, be mindful of where you live and use that, learn how to use that in your advantage instead of trying to force something on your body through supplements, all kind of weird protocols that you don't even know what can actually do to you. 100%. 100%. Yeah. The, 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 that last part of being mindful of your environment is crucial, especially in modern world, because your environment is changing very fast, right? Mm -hmm. Like you may be living in a place that's safe, right? A place that has low population. Five years from now, you could have very dense population with a lot of cell phone towers, with a lot of Wi-Fi all around. And, and all of a sudden, the environment that was good five years ago is no longer an environment that is good anymore. Yeah, so, and we see it all the time, you know, where you can track like how many like 5G towers around. Like, I am here now, I have three within three mile radius. Yeah. I have people I work with who have 400. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, That's and, and, those... and the, the, dif the difference in health between someone I work here with and someone I work there with is so obvious, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of people just don't give the environment. The, the the magnitude that it actually possesses on the body, right? The environment is number one forever and ever. The yeah. environment is number one on your health. And that is something that people need to start paying attention a lot more to. Yeah. And like we've said a million times before, it doesn't need you to permanently leave the environment, but can you tap into that environment for your genetics, so to say, at least once a week or so? That's yeah. going to do you more good than harm than just trying to medicate yourself through whatever ailments your body might have. So, no, I really appreciate your time, David, and uh, we'll chat in the next video. Awesome. Thank you very much.